So we've been looking at the development of post-war skyscrapers and particularly uh, the innovations in Chicago that were starting to happen uh, after World War II. We finished with this building, which is a fairly typical steel-framed building by SOM done in 1963. What I want to talk about in this next phase and in the final bit are, is, is, are the results of one of the really great innovations in high-rise construction. Uh, namely the tube structure, which was developed by Fosler Kahn, Bruce Graham, and Myron Goldsmith uh, of SOM about the time that they were doing these other sort of what we think of as classic sort of Chicago style uh, post-war uh, skyscrapers. Kahn, uh, as an engineer, was remarkably gifted. Uh, he figured out, of course, this detail uh, on inland steel as his sort of audition for the firm uh, and came to be really sort of the great thinker, the great not only technical uh, engineer, but also really one of the great engineering philosophers of, of the post-war era. And his sort of genius was in seeing the skyscraper structure not as a connection of discrete elements so much, but rather really as an organism, thinking about the building at very, very large scale and comparing it to simpler, relatively straightforward structural schemes that was easier to sort of get one's mind around. Um, in particular, uh, he noted that there were two ways that tall buildings resisted wind. Uh, one through what he called shear racking, where the, 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 the resistance of the columns and the stiffly connected girders uh, that, that were attached to them uh, would all help to resist wind. You can see in the diagram that to uh, shift or to rack a tall, rigid frame, you have to uh, deform not only the columns, but also the girders if you've connected them with really uh, robust 90 degree uh, connections, then every element in the building uh, has to has to uh, deform. This is not a new idea. This was the structural innovation that really uh, stayed the Reliance building, the Fisher building, some of those early steel frames that were riveted, uh, as we saw a few lectures ago. Um, but Kahn realized that that was happening simultaneously with the behavior of the skyscraper as a giant cantilever. And he described this as both cantilever bending, but also uh, the, the slightly odder description of column shortening. In other words, when the wind hits this building, uh, it, it's not only trying to shear the building off of its foundations, it's trying to bend it like a giant cantilever that's sticking up from the ground. This goes back to William LeBaron Jenny's idea that his uh, iron frames and steel frames were quote unquote built like bridges, that they were essentially like railroad truss bridges that were sticking out of the ground. And Kahn's uh, idea was that one way to think of this was to think about the compressive elements of that cantilever beam. In other words, the leeward uh, side of the building, which would be in compression as the, the building acted like a giant cantilever. To think about that as column shortening, that the, the resistance of the column to deflection, in this case under compression, would also help to contribute. And Kahn recognized that these two would work together to resist deformation and therefore to resist against wind, that the building would act as a kind of integrated organism, essentially. And this realization meant that uh, Kahn began to think of the the tower structure or the skyscraper structure really is a giant column or a giant, as he would put it, a hollow tube. That if you concentrated the structure of the building around the perimeter, you would be designing it basically like a giant hollow column. This stood to get all of the structure out of the, the center of the building uh, to make uh, column free spaces. But it also meant that with a relatively small amount of structure, you could get a fairly large amount of wind bracing, as long as you could rigidly fix all of these elements together. Um, here are these kind of four uh, aspects or these four advantages that uh, the engineer and, and writer Mark Fintel uh, uh, came up with kind of in retrospect in 1986, um, that, that treating the building basically as a giant hollow column um, meant that you were taking greater advantage of the amount of material you were putting in, right? Just like a hollow column, the, the concrete in a, in a concrete tube or the steel in a steel tube is concentrated where it's likely to do the most, be the most effective, give the most effective resistance uh, to, to, to wind effects. 
the, uh, the, the walls, the thin, relatively thin walls of the hollow tube would be braced by the floor plates. Uh, this is, of course, very efficient for apartments, but it also makes sense for commercial construction. Uh, and by doing this, you're taking away all of the problems with uh, shear, but you're also taking the lateral load basically out of the, the, the flat plates, out of the slabs, which means that they can be designed a little bit more efficiently. Uh, using the structure on the perimeter, uh, treating it as cladding in addition to structure, of course, reduces the cladding cost. You're getting two functions for the price of one, basically, because the structure can work uh, as cladding. And most interestingly, uh, Fintel says, the frame tube is an honest visual expression of the structure. We'll come back to that here uh, in just a second. Um, Kahn described the tube as being ideally suited in a few varieties for certain heights. Uh, of building. And as you can see here, up to about 40, 50 stories, you can use, he thought, standard kind of rigid frames, see on the left, frames with shear trusses in the core or what he called belt trusses, where you're basically wrapping the, the, the structure with these belts that are attached to the core that, that help to resist uh, the deflection and wind. Past that, he thought that the tube structure would be most effective, treating the building like giant uh, open columns. And he came at this in a couple of steps. Um, on the right, you see diagrams that Kahn drew to explain what he called uh, tube shear wall interaction, where the walls of the core and the tube of the exterior were working together. And as you can see, they have synergetic effects where the, the, the free wall, as he put it, is strong in one part of the building. The free frame is strong in a different part and together uh, they end up working uh, to, to, to reduce the amount of deflection, therefore to resist uh, wind in a much more uh, efficient way. This theory eventually led to the completely hollow tube, as we'll see. But these came with a, a, a kind of um, a philosophy about expressed structure that went uh, beyond some of the things we've seen before. And, and some of that really was due to the people that Kahn worked with uh, at SOM. One of them was Myron Goldsmith, who, was, uh, who became a partner at SOM and was one of the rare like, direct links between Mies van der Rohe's office uh, and Skidmore Owings and Merrill. SOM were often sort of uh, referred to as the quote unquote three blind Mies because their buildings were so Mies-like. Um, but they actually had uh, greater, uh, they drew from uh, all around the country, not just from Chicago, not just from IIT. Myron Goldsmith, however, was a Chicago native, was trained under, at, at, under Mies at IIT, went to work for Mies, and then also in 1953 got a Fulbright uh, to go study under Nervi uh, at the University of Rome. So he has this pedigree of working under the, the kind of German uh, Chicago skyscraper master and also studying under the Italian concrete master. Beginning in 1961, he taught uh, at IIT, and he was instrumental in making this link between uh, SOM's practice and the, the kind of research that, that went on uh, down at uh, the Illinois Institute of Technology. His work for Mies was uh, all about kind of structural expression, and in fact, he had uh, famous kind of arguments, friendly arguments, with Mies about the proper role of structural expression. Um, notably, Goldsmith worked on the Farnsworth House, one of Mies's more famous uh, projects, and on this sort of follow-up project to it called the 50 by 50 House. Mies designed this uh, to unbuilt house to be supported at the mid-spans of this giant 50 by 50 space frame roof. And on the right, you can see Goldsmith arguing with him that actually the more uh, the, the more sensible places to support a 50 by 50 space frame would be on the corner, not on the, the, the mid-span. Mies won the argument since he owned the firm. And so the 50 by 50 houses come down to us just in this model that you see on the left. Goldsmith here, though, is arguing for a, a, a structural rationalism, something that um, I, I think comes more from his interest in Nervi than in his study uh, under Mies. Um, he left the office shortly after that project and uh, went on to not only study under uh, Nervi, but also to do a master's thesis at IIT, to come back and do a master's thesis at IIT uh, that he called the effects of scale. 
This, as you can see on the left, goes back to Galileo, right? The idea that when we take a structure and uh, double its size, we actually need to uh, quadruple the size of most of its structural members. That if you take a dog and blow its dimensions up uh, two times as big, you don't get two times as much dog, you get four times as much dog. And this exponential increase, this sort of chasing, chasing your tail as structures get bigger and bigger, means that the, the structural type that might apply to one scale of building doesn't necessarily apply to another. And to illustrate this, Goldsmith drew this series of bridges where he said that up to six or 700 feet, a simple truss bridge is fine. Past that, it's more economical to change the system, not to just keep enlarging the truss, but to change the system to, in this case, a concrete plate girder. Uh, a continuous truss, as you get bigger than 1,500 feet or so, Goldsmith said it, it gets more economical to start using um, steel arches, cantilevers past 2,000 feet, and maybe the most convincing argument is by the time you get up to 4,000 feet of span, none of these systems work, and you have to actually radically change the system, go beyond arches, go beyond trusses, go beyond traditional notions of bending and compression and actually do a, a full suspension bridge. So the scale of the construction uh, defines or determines the type of structure that you're going to use. There's a structural appropriateness uh, to each one. And Goldsmith uh, in his work thought that this was a legitimate set of vocabulary or set of grammar uh, for architects to work with. So he was trained as both an architect and an engineer and was interested in the visual expression of structural principles. Here, some of the work that he did for uh, SOM, the Oakland Coliseum on the left, uh, Kitt Peak Observatory, maybe his most famous work in the middle, and on the right, an unbuilt cable-stayed uh, bridge that was to go in Northern California called the Ruckachucky Bridge, where the arc of the bridge and the suspension cables anchored into the rock of the river banks themselves uh, was going to create this sort of splay pattern of, of cables that he thought was particularly honest, right? particularly straightforward in explaining uh, how it would stand up. It was Goldsmith who came up with the initial drawings that suggested that these might also, this uh, idea might also apply to skyscraper construction. That just like suspension bridges, there might be perfect structural types for perfect heights. In his own thesis, he designed this kind of mega frame that he thought would be the most efficient for uh, a building of, I think this was about 80 stories, where you have giant compressive piers and then tensile columns that hold the floors up uh, in between. You can see that the compression piers get bigger as they come down to the ground, and you can see that the joints are very clearly rigid joints, that the columns splay outward so that there's maximum amount of interface between the girders and the columns that then gives the the mega frame its rigidity uh, against wind and on the right you can see this is goldsmith's version of, of the drawing that khan would do where he shows for steel structures these are the various uh, types of uh, structure appropriate for individual heights and he does that for concrete uh, as well and interestingly, Goldsmith did uh, a handful of alternatives for the mega frame. In other words, the mega frame was going to be in concrete. If, for example, steel was a, a cheaper building material, how would you do it in that? And you can see here, kind of looking ahead, the idea that um, you, know, you, you might use diagonal bracing in steel because it's easier to build uh, than it would be in, in concrete. So that the, the geometry or the, the structural type might not only relate to the scale of the building, but also to the materials being used. Kahn and Goldsmith and Bruce Graham, who would become Kahn's kind of major uh, design partner, uh, first worked together on the tube idea in this building in Chicago called the Brunswick Building. It is a concrete frame building, and it is a tube plus core structure. So not a pure tube yet, but one step toward that. Whereas you can see most of the structure is deployed around the exterior, this deep uh, concrete wall. And the, 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 the wall is basically a, a shear wall that's punctured by hundreds of windows. 
The connections between the verticals and the horizontals are made rigid by the fact that they're monolithic, they're in concrete. If you look closely, you can see that the windows all have a little bit of an upstand beam that gives them uh, uh, the enough uh, interface to, to make them rigid. And you can get the sense that that perimeter set of, are they mullions, are they columns, is it a wall? They're all somewhere in between, but that's acting basically as a giant hollow column. Within that, there is a set of shear walls around the core, and this is an example of shear wall to interaction, right? They're both working. The, the shear walls uh, are more effective at the lower level. The uh, tube is more effective at the upper level. You can see that there's a problem if you're trying to do a monumental skyscraper with bringing this very, very dense network of verticals all the way down to the ground. And Goldsmith is the one who's responsible for developing the idea of this giant transfer beam that picks up all of that uh, loading and carries it down to the ground on these four giant piers. Um, that, of course, negates the idea that the buildings working as a giant column, right? You, that's exactly where you would want uh, the most rigid connection to the ground. But the, the skin of the building, the hollow tube of the building, uh, proves to be an effective kind of partner with the shear walls around the core, which are doing a lot of the work uh, of bringing the, the lateral loads in particular down to the foundations. <clears throat> You can see too that there are uh, air conditioning units integrated with the exterior skin. They kind of hide the upstand beam that's doing a lot of the work of making that uh, perimeter wall rigid. And you can see that the result is that there are no interior columns, right? The, the office floors on this building could be designed in any way the interior uh, planners needed to because there's no structure that's, that's blocking uh, any of that. And Goldsmith, too, was responsible, I think, largely for the aesthetic decisions here, um, taking that uh, transfer beam and really making something of it. Um, the building was criticized for putting this giant, very heavy concrete structure on what looked like fairly flimsy travertine piers. Initially, the entire building was supposed to be clad in travertine, and that was cut for budget reasons uh, at, the, at the last minute. Khan, on the other hand, was responsible for thinking about how the building would deflect and how to connect that perimeter structure with the stiff core of, of shear walls. You can see here that there are hinged sections uh, at, where the, the slabs meet the perimeter wall. And that is in part because Khan was worried about the differential thermal expansion between the exposed concrete on the outside, which would get very cold in Chicago winters, and the 72 degree core uh, that would always be at room temperature on the inside. And these hinges allow for about an inch of total movement uh, between the two, right? Something that is really serious if you're trying to put structure both on the outside and on the inside uh, of a building that's gonna experience really, really cold weather. The building's maybe best known though for this uh, transfer girder and for the flare of the, um, uh, of the verticals as they meet uh, that girder. The Brunswick is only about three blocks uh, north of the Monadnock, this uh, brick structure from 1892 that we looked at uh, in the, uh, our first lecture on, on skyscrapers. And you can see that the two kind of mimic one another, or the, the Brunswick really mimics the, the, uh, the Monadnock in the way that its quote-unquote bearing wall, all of these uh, fine concrete mullions, splay out as they meet the transfer girder. Um, Goldsmith said that, you know, really he was just trying to, to make a, a, a very robust connection uh, between the two and that architecturally he wanted the, the bearing wall and the girder to relate better than they would if they were strictly set back. But there's a nod here, I think, too, to, to, the, to one of the great kind of traditions of bearing wall construction. When we talked about the Monadnock, we talked about the fact that it's part bearing wall and part steel structure. But never mind that for the moment. The principle is there, right? That the, the bearing wall gets thicker and thicker as it comes down to the base. The Brunswick was written about in some quarters as a quote unquote return to the bearing wall. The idea that the exterior uh, is, is once again doing some of the, the structural, uh, 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 has some of the structural responsibility, right? Of carrying the weight uh, of the building. Almost simultaneous to the Brunswick, uh, SOM does another building, the DeWitt Chestnut Apartments, 
that has a slightly different program. It's residential instead of commercial, uh, all in concrete like the Brunswick. But as you can see from the, the kind of mess around the center of the building, there's no really coherent core to a residential building. You have fewer elevators, so uh, shorter runs of shear wall, and you have much more intricate planning, right? The apartments are carved up, they're not open plan. And the columns, as you can see, are basically placed where they make the most sense from a, a space planning point of view, instead of from a structural point of view. Khan made the leap here to saying, fine, all of those columns, the kind of mess of columns in the middle are only going to carry the gravity load of the building. And we're gonna rely on the exterior skin, not only for some of its uh, structural capacity, right? The return of the bearing wall, this, the skin is gonna hold up the edges of the floor plate, but all of the lateral resistance, all of the resistance to wind into a chestnut is going to be compressed basically onto that bearing wall on the exterior. DeWitt Chestnut is a true tube structure. Uh, it is designed to resist the wind like a giant cantilever. There is no frame shear wall interaction because there are no shear walls. The skin is doing all the work. It's like a giant paper towel tube uh, that is uh, up, you know, 60, 70 stories tall. And all of that perimeter structure is helping the building to resist lateral loads. Spoiler alert there in the background on the left, we'll get to that. A taller building in the background in, in the next part of the lecture. Um, Goldsmith's idea though that the, the structure ought to define or, or at least inspire the aesthetics um, plays out here uh, as well. Um, you can see that the, the, uh, the tube structure is expressed. It's right on the exterior. They did actually clad this one in travertine in part as insulation to protect the, the concrete structure from the cold uh, outside, there's travertine and then a layer of, of solid ins insulation. Um, and if you look very, very closely at the elevation, you can see that all of the columns and all of the girders uh, taper as they get toward the top, that the windows at the top are proportionally and in true dimensions larger than those toward the base. It's a really, really, really subtle um, uh, variation. It's just a, a couple of inches every few floors, but it helps to sort of draw the eye up. And that sort of very, very gradual change over the elevation is something that's very intentional. A difficult thing to uh, plan, a difficult thing to draw, difficult thing to achieve on site. One that has some structural advantages, the building is a little more ductile toward the top, which helps it to shed some of the wind load uh, as, it, as, 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 um, as it goes up, uh, but also I think is predominantly visual. It gets to this idea that Goldsmith had about really expressing the way the structure works. Um, Goldsmith would sort of go off on his own within the firm and do some of the, the projects that we looked at earlier. Graham and Kahn really formed the partnership that went on to, to take this structure to greater visual and also structural uh, lengths. Some of the tube structures they did elsewhere uh, looked at the problem of bringing the verticals all the way down to the ground without the transfer beam that was very obvious at the Brunswick, maybe a little more subtle uh, at, at DeWitt Chestnut. Um, but Kahn was really interested in, in how uh, the bearing wall might express itself similar to the way the Monadnock did um, while still creating a kind of reasonable ground floor condition, right? a monumental enough entrance. Um, here at a building in Houston that they did a few years later, you can see that the, the columns actually get wider and wider in these two critical areas on the facade as, as they come down to the ground. And what that means is that between them, uh, Graham can open up these larger portals into the, into the building lobby that some of the columns can stop. They shed their load uh, onto the, the sort of bigger collections of columns that are about a quarter of the way in on either side. And that allows Graham to open up uh, the base just a little bit. Um, One Shell Plaza, 715 feet tall. You can see that it had, has uh, shear walls uh, along with uh, this uh, external bearing wall or system of mullion columns, if you like, on the exterior uh, that share the, the duties of, of resisting uh, the wind load. And you can see that they experimented with this in a number of ways. Uh, on the left, another a tube structure that if you look down toward the base, you can see the loads beginning to uh, uh, focus in on every other or every third or fourth uh, 
uh, column so that that opens up the lobby down at the base. Two in Chicago on the right. Uh, one is the, the second Hartford Plaza where you can see that it's only every other column that comes down to the ground. The columns in between actually stop and in the lower four or five floors become tension columns. They're actually carried by the rigid network, the rigid grid of columns and girders uh, above them. And that opens up again larger spaces for uh, entries into the lobby, right? A, a way of connecting the lobby and the exterior. And on the far right, a uh, hybrid structure, a tube structure on the outside, a steel structure on the inside built on the air rights over uh, railroad tracks in Chicago. And the tube dimensions are calculated to sort of pass between the, the active tracks below. The core in the middle, since it's steel, um, has a little bit more flexibility uh, in where things land. And again, most of the work, especially the lateral work, is being done uh, by that core on the outside. It's a difficult thing to do, right? To, to change the structural performance of the wall as it comes down to the ground, sometimes more successful than others. Um, you can see other examples here, Rochester, New York, uh, in particular, where Kahn and Graham are playing around with this idea of the load sort of flowing through the exterior uh, bearing wall of, of, of concrete mullion columns and, and finding ways to make that not only uh, effective structurally, but also explicit. Uh, visually. Some of these I think were more successful than others. The one on the left I think uh, repeats maybe the, the, the clunky uh, connection between that very elegant bearing wall and these travertine piers that the, the, um, the, the, the Brunswick had. Um, Kahn and Graham would go on to design tube structures that we'll look at in the next segment um, in steel uh, in addition to concrete, and in steel with kind of greater uh, ability to think about the elements and the way they contributed to the skin of a, of a tube structure, um, Kahn and Graham were able to achieve not only greater heights, but I think also greater integration of uh, aesthetics and structure. And we'll take a look at those in the next, uh, next part of the lecture.